uh, in the hallway. In John 10, Jesus said his sheep hear his voice. What does hearing God's voice look like? And I'll pause right there. Uh, the context of John 10, remember the first canon of textual interpretation is what was the Lord talking about to the audience that initially heard it. That whole section is about salvation. Jesus is talking about being saved and assurance of salvation and knowing that you're saved and what happens when you get saved. So what does hearing God's voice look like? It looks like calling in the name of the Lord and being saved and that's the initiation of hearing his voice. It's the first time we understand our need, we're convicted, we understand he's our only hope, we cry out to him and so we respond to his voice because he is the one who came seeking Remember, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is the one that comes looking for us. And, you know, I know that, that sometimes we have trouble separating between the roles of the Trinity, but through the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, we are convicted of our sin, and we first hear his voice. Probably the first time we hear his voice in the scriptural sense is when we're convicted of our sin, and the Holy Spirit starts, we start paying attention and sensing that. Uh, but how do I know it's him I'm hearing? because he always agrees with his word. And so if he ever tells you something that's not consistent with the word, you can be sure you're not hearing his voice. In John 10, I already said this, it's about the realm of salvation. John 6 talks about uh, how sheep hear his voice. Romans 8, oh, this is the last one, then we'll go. Aren't you glad that we did the first one? Because we only got to the second one this way. But look at Romans 8 for just a moment. And this is what is so important about knowing the Lord's will. Romans 8, starting in verse 14, talks about this realm of the Holy Spirit witnessing to us. And it says, um, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So salvation introduces me to this following. I'm being led, I'm following, and, and the Spirit of God is, is guiding me. And Verse 15, you didn't receive a spirit of bondage to fear, but the spirit of adoption. We know we're in the family. We have that familial closeness, Abba, Father. Now look at this. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If we suffer with him, we will be glorified together. And so this is all talking about what begins at salvation, the assurance that comes of the Spirit, but immediately what the Apostle Paul said to these early believers is, but you gotta start testing all things. And you search and test via the scriptures, not experience, feeling, trees falling in the woods. Why would you take the lesser, which is the possibility of some subjective, the last thing I say about this is, uh, it is amazing to think what people are taking upon themselves. If I think that God told me something, and I tell you, I am functioning as a prophet. A prophet in the Old Testament sense and in the, the strictest New Testament sense is someone that spoke for God and gave authoritative revelation. God is not revealing anymore. His revelation, it says in Jude, it says the, the faith once and for all delivered. It's in the it's in the finalized tense, that it's kind of like the document has been saved and closed and locked, and it's not being added to. And as soon as I say, the Lord told me, that's, I can say that. But if I say, the Lord told me, and you need to do this, I am all of a sudden becoming a conduit of new revelation. That is a dangerous place to be. And there's so many warnings about false prophets. And that's someone that claims God told them something. And, and the Lord says, you better be careful because if what you say doesn't 100% occur, you're a false prophet. But we'll pick up at two and a half next week. And there's lots more verses coming from three onward. But let's, why don't we stand? You've been sitting so long. We're going into communion. And as we stand, I'm going to just, just ask the elders and deacons to go and prepare. But imagine Communion is when we get to come before God. We get to come into his presence. We get to come into his presence. And as we come, the scriptures say that we're supposed to make sure we have clean hands and a pure heart. And only God can give those two. We ask him to cleanse us of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. 
It's any wrong attitudes, any wrong desires that we are conscious of. We ask him to cleanse us. And any filthiness of the, the flesh and, and the clean hands thing is, is there anything that's unresolved? And before we take part in communion, if there are some unforgiven trespass with another believer or if there's anything outstanding in our life, we have to judge ourselves. Before we come to communion, we have to say, Lord, I am going to go to that person. I'm going to make that right. I do not want that hanging over me before I take part in communion. That's what we do before every communion. You know, there should be no unresolved relationship in the church if you come to communion because you don't want to, the Bible says, take part in communion with any unforsaken sin. And if we're holding bitterness or a grudge or don't talk to that person, don't like that person, going to get even with that person, communion invites God's chastisement on our life. So as we stand before the Lord, we're going to pray. In your heart, make sure you have your hands washed before you eat and say, Lord, I don't want to be holding on to any unresolved situation with my husband, with my wife, with my parents, with my children, with my fellow employees or schoolmates or whatever. I'm going to have clean hands and I ask you to cleanse my heart because I want to come before you purely to offer worship. This is the highest worship we can offer. Holding a picture of Christ's body, holding a picture of his blood, partaking of it, and communing with him. This is next to heaven. This is the highest worship we offer. Make sure that you have clean hands and a pure heart.